Welcome to the College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. Here's Shahan J. Haraja and Bobak Hayeri. Hey, everybody, it's the College Football Survivor Show. I'm Bob Akairi with my co host, Shahan J. Araja, National College Football Writer for CBS Sports. We're always glad to have you with us. Now, today, the two of us are going to conduct a QB draft of sorts, picking who we would want to helm each of our hypothetical college football squads uh, with the kind of trying to cover several categories diversifying and then kind of finding a few reasons to pick quarterbacks, not just the best, best of the best um, people who we think might be interesting in various styles. So, but before we dive in, let me remind you that you can find us on X and TikTok at CFB Survivor Show, where we have video highlights of the show, run polls and listen to your feedback. Please take a moment if you can to like, rate and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcast. We always appreciate that. So, this is an interesting kind of um, interesting scenario you put together because to everyone, Shahan, this is his idea, and I love it because it isn't just like we're going to do a quarterback draft, but we have to include a few people in our list. Why don't you break it down for us? So we're going to pick eight total, and these guys can come off the board, by the way, in any order, but there are three slots that you do have to fill. Two of them have to be transfer quarterbacks. So we're not just going to pick the eight total best, although I'll tell you what, there are some – Good transfer quarterbacks who are going to be very high on our list. And then the last one, we have to pick a first-year starting quarterback. Now, look, they're, they're guys who maybe started the bowl game. They're guys who, who maybe like played one or two games late in the year. Those guys are still on the board. It's a, it's a first-time, full-time starting quarterback that, uh, that you have to pick. And then the other five can be anybody that you like. But I, the hope with this and, and the hope with this approach is, is that we're not just saying, here are the 16 best returning quarterbacks in college football. I think that's a boring conversation to have. Uh, it's more, how can we uh, kind of go around the country, look at some of the names that, uh, one, that are going to be the best in the country in a year where so many of the best quarterbacks did leap for the NFL, right? We, we have Michael Penix, we have Caleb Williams, we have Bo Nix, we have Jaden Daniels, we have Drake May. Uh, all of those guys were kind of consensus uh, top 10 to 15 type of picks. J.J. McCarthy, of course, also a top 12 pick in the NFL draft. All those guys are gone. And we are in a reality now where there might not be a quarterback heading into the year considered a top 10 pick in the 2025 NFL draft. I, I expect that will change, of course. I think that somebody will step up. But because we have such a fresh, clean year, I think it's a perfect opportunity to kind of run through and, and touch on as many different people as possible. Yeah, I like this idea. I It's funny, when I was putting together my list, I'm like, how am I approaching this? And even though we've, we've been talking a lot last couple of weeks, everyone has, about the new video game that's coming out, the EA, call, uh, EA Sports College Football game. And it made me think back to when I was at my height of playing the game, particularly, oh, in the aughts and, and early teens. And I always used to like the fun of creating my own team. And, uh, and you know, I, I, my alma mater was USC, so you'd have to switch a team to, to add a team, and I'd always just switch out USC. I wouldn't have to worry about playing them. But I always used to create, like, kind of odd West Coast teams, like the University of Alaska would have a team, or maybe uh, the, my, my local Cal State Bakersfield where I grew up. You know, I'd give the Roadrunners a football team. So I'm thinking to myself, if I'm putting together a team and I could grab any of these quarterbacks from these categories – who would I take? And, and that was my approach. But at the same time, again, I love the idea of including a pair of transfers and a first-time starter. So, you know, I might just kick us off. I, I was thinking, like, who would be my number one pick? Who is someone who has talent but is interesting? And, you know, again, if I'm, if I'm starting a team from scratch, I kind of trust that he knows how to operate in kind of a disastrous situation if, they're, if the talent level isn't all there. So you could probably maybe not be surprised under that criteria – Shador Sanders was actually my first selection because I thought about him and I'm like, he played behind one of the worst offensive lines, was like 52 sacks, broke his back in the process of getting sacked by all of those defenders running through. But I mean, I think overall his ability to maintain um, and prove his worth and maintain his, you know, again, we're talking about the draft stock is very early now, but to maintain that because of his arm and accuracy, um, you know, I'm hoping, you know, if we're looking at what Colorado is doing, you'll know, probably see potentially improvement uh, with a full season with Pat Schumer, you know, but he's got to do a little bit more of his own to limit sacks. But again, he's got the ability to process things quickly. Um, 
I think his his just his mental ability and the fact that he grew up maybe surrounded by the NFL and all of this stuff is sort of why he can operate so well in situations that might quite literally crush another quarterback in his shoes. So that's why I went a little bit I went a little bit different, or at least than I thought I was going to at the outset. And I thought I think just that combination of athleticism, accuracy and touch and arm strength, Jador Sanders was going to be my first off the board. Wow. He he was high on my board. He was definitely not my number one. I agree what you're saying about his ability to uh, make things happen out of nothing. Although at the same time, I think that there was a lot of like not making things happen out of nothing too. He holds <laughs> on to the ball quite a bit. Uh, I he Don't get me wrong. I mean, the offensive line struggled a lot, but he caused a lot of sacks too, just with his holding on to the ball. He was surrounded by a lot of great wide receivers. And at the beginning of the year when he was playing well, played in a different kind of system too. Now, uh, again, I think that there is a very real chance that he could be a top 10 pick in the upcoming draft, that he could be uh, potentially the first quarterback off the board. I, I'm not there yet. I think that there may be two guys who I think uh, start the year ahead of him, but it's not a bad pick at all. I mean, again, he would have been somebody probably in my first three picks I would have considered, but he would not have been my number one. So I'm glad that you uh, you left me who I think the number one guy in the country is coming into the year. And that's Carson Beck with the, the Georgia Bulldogs. You know, it's funny. We got so used to Georgia under Stetson Bennett just being consistently good that I, I think we are taking for granted high-level quarterback play. And if this was 20 years ago, Carson Beck would be just on top of everybody's list, right? Like, he he is such a throwback almost in a way. Like, he's Matt Ryan. He's Kirk Cousins. He, he's one of these guys who just does everything well as a quarterback. And Certainly the the big question, like you said, is that we have more examples of a player like Shador Sanders making stuff happen out of nothing. But like Carson Beck was handed a lot and he delivered a lot. Uh, he completed 72 percent of his passes, just under 4000 yards passing. Very impressive. Nine and a half yards per pass attempt. That's pretty crazy to be honest nine and a half yards for pass attempt as a primary starting quarterback uh 24 touchdowns six interceptions i mean he threw the ball less than some of these other guys on the list um but but it's because of how good they were right like it's it's because they didn't need him to throw a lot more than he did and i actually think in some ways he's the type of player that I think would actually benefit from having more touches and throwing the ball more potentially and you know, they were able to so seamlessly transition uh, this Georgia offense from being a more of a run based offense with some nice sort of intermediate passing stuff to a truly pass based offense, despite not having a number one type receiver. Lad McConkey at times was that guy, but not necessarily. Brock Bowers, of course, a great player, but not exactly a downfield threat either. And I actually think that in some ways, and, and I don't want to ever imply that George is at a talent disadvantage to anybody ever, but I, I do think that, I mean, imagine him with some of, I, I mean, even imagine him with some of the receivers that Shador played with, right? Like imagine Travis Hunter catching passes from Carson Beck. That would be really exciting. Uh, I, I think that he just does a lot of the little things well. I mean, a, a, a obviously a team that we'll get to later on this list. Imagine Carson Beck with some of those Texas receivers, right? With some of those Ohio State receivers. I think that he would be putting up sort of like Heisman caliber numbers if he had that kind of team. And, and Georgia just doesn't play that way. So he's not going to he's not gonna put up 5,000 yards because that's just not what they do. But I think that he, for my money right now, is the number one quarterback in the country. And so I will take him with my first pick. I think he's a great pick. I think he was my number two. Um, and I went only based on talent around him was, I think, again, <laughs> Colorado's talent is not going to compare uh, pound for pound with the talent on the Georgia on the Georgia Bulldogs. But at the same time, um, especially Beck's ability to grow over the season and perform best in some of the toughest games like he would rise up. His best performances were against typically ranked opponents. Um, and, you know, even losing someone like Brock Bowers or Lad McConkey, I think they're going to reload pretty well. They're never going to be at a. At a problem, they've got some good transfers in uh, from Stanford, that tight end. They've got a good receivers, and they're bringing in new receivers. So I think his poise, his ability to scan the field, and his uh, his ability to layer his throws, I, I think 
he's a great pick and he was my number two. And again, I, I decided to go a little fun and a little riskier with my number one. So I'm glad he went with the safer bet. In fact, <laughs> that goes to my number. So my second pick, which is going down on actually the third on my list, is also, I thought, one of the safest quarterbacks and one that you've kind of hinted at already. And that's Quinn Ewers at Texas. Um, I think the pressure of having, you know, Arch Manning, I kind of, we were teasing a little bit before the show. I said, you know, watch Arch Manning is going to, I'll pick him and just say that he's going to make an EA cover jinx. Now that we know that Ewers is on the cover and by the way, Colorado guy right in the middle. I I told you, I, they're going to go after that, 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 that casual fan and put a Colorado player in the middle, but I'm just, <laughs> I'm just gonna, I'm just gonna walk away. Hey, from that I, one. I but, picked that one. I, I picked that one too. When we, <laughs> when we did our projections, <laughs> they should go as far as I was saying, like put Dion on the cover, like a <laughs> wink. <laughs> but, uh, but, but that said, I think that pressure coming from Arch Manning is only going to push yours to, to step up a little bit, because as was said before last season, you know, in the off season, he kind of he dedicated himself to getting better and he was able to step up his game, which he did. So I think this added pressure of, of knowing that there's the, the chosen one behind him is going to make him better. And I think just his experience, his ability to take advantage of the talent around them. Um, when Jonathan Brooks went down, you know, the team didn't, you know, there was concerns that Texas wasn't going to be where it was before and might falter and it didn't. And I think a lot of that has to do with, with again, Ewer's ability to lead that offense. So if he can improve his mechanics, if he can tighten up, um, and that was just, you know, some of his down th- downfield accuracy issues like that, I think those are things that can be addressed. And I think he's he's one of the safer picks out there. I think he is, you know, I don't know. I don't want to, I'm not going to compare him to quarterbacks last year, but if I were to pick someone who isn't the flashiest quarterback, but I think is a safe pick, I think Quinn Ewers is that guy. Yeah, I... So I, I've talked about before. I mean, Quinn Ewers uh, grew up down the street from me. Like he actually, funnily enough, went to my rival high school. I uh, went to South Lake Carroll. I went to Coppell. Uh, and so I've I've been watching him for a long time. And he is such an incredible talent. He's got fantastic arm strength. He makes the game look effortless. I, d- I need to see more focus from him. You know, his play, it, it definitely improved from year one to year two. And actually, that that gives me some optimism that it can in- improve from year two to year three. But it, it's just the details, right? Like, that that's where he's been struggling. It's the footwork stuff. Uh, you know, he's he's constantly trying to go off his back foot. He's not planting the way that he really needs to. It's, I mean, it, I we just haven't seen that with enough consistency. I look at at a game like, uh, like the college football playoff game, completes 56% of his passes, right? Like, these are just the things that you see happen. Now, again, like I mentioned, uh, I think that that Tex did a good job of figuring out what he could do effectively. I remember that Big 12 title game that I was at. Uh, they just made the game easy for him, right? Like, he's so good at the, the, the close and intermediate stuff, and they just leaned on it because they could. I, again, I, I need to see consistency from him I, and he has so much talent around him he has so much help his receiving talent uh in 2024 might actually be better than in 2023 when he lost two guys who were borderline first round nfl draft picks but i, I that's the only thing that's holding me back is, is i don't think he's been a consistent enough player uh not just in terms of his actual production and performance but also just like play to play in terms of the details of playing quarterback. Like to me, he is in in some ways the opposite of Carson Beck. He's a lot more talented and I don't feel like I know what I'm going to get from him play to play. And again, it it improved so much from year one to year two. I mean, year one, the latter half of his season was a disaster, frankly. And and I don't think enough people realize that Uh, year two took a big step forward. I need to see that year three jump, but I, I think it's a good safe pick. Uh, to put him right here at number three. Excellent. Who you got as your next? I do think that this is where the board starts to get a little interesting. Um, And so with that said, I'm going to go ahead and take the first transfer quarterback on the board. I'm going to go with someone who I think is the safe pick of the transfer quarterbacks. And that's Dylan Gabriel at Oregon. You know, Dylan Gabriel comes to Oregon in some ways in a similar way to to Bo Nix as an imperfect player, 
but one who has very obvious skills. And we saw that carry Oklahoma in a lot of ways last year, completed almost 70% of his passes, also averaged nine and a half yards per pass attempt. Uh, the, the issue with, with Gabriel has always been the intermediate stuff. He can hit the bombs and he can hit the screens and you just want to see a little more in between. But I think he's going to have substantially more help at Oregon than he ever had at Oklahoma and obviously had uh, than he had during his time at UCF as well. I mean, they bring in Evan Stewart as a wide receiver. Uh, they have so much obviously in reserve already. They've got a great offensive line. They play a fantastic defense and with Will, uh, with Will Stein rather at offensive coordinator, you've got a, an offensive coordinator who's proven that he can make the game easy for his quarterbacks. He can find out what they do and, and maximize it. And so you know, from my perspective, like if, if you're talking about pure talents, I don't know that I'd have Dylan Gabriel this high on the list. But I think in terms of transfers and the production that I expect from him this upcoming season on a team that we've said we expect to be a top four team in the country heading into the season. I, I think Dylan Gabriel is sort of the safe pick of the transfers. I agree with you 100 percent. I think um, especially look, because my transfer candidates, he was he was one of my two transfer candidates. It's like but he was the safe pick. And then there was the, you know, let's just go for it over this guy. In fact, he's <laughs> my other one is so I think I like him so much, but I don't feel comfortable enough to put him quite that high. I'm going to get to him. I'm almost certain I'm going to get to him or you're going to get to him. But uh, but yeah, I think I think that's a great pick. And it's going to be interesting to see um, the similarities to Bo Nix and the ability he fits in. I don't know if he's got the same talent level as Bo Nix, just as raw talent. But um, I think it'll be fascinating to see him on his third team. And, and, you know, it's funny how some of these guys, you know, these these grizzled veterans who've been on so many teams and grew up in an entirely different state altogether, um, how they do. But again, the similarities and the, and the strengths that he brings, uh, I'm very curious to see how Oregon unlocks that. You know, I'm not going to quite jump to a transfer portal yet, but I, there is one player, and this is someone who I, I'm always surprised because I always feel like, he should be higher ranked in a lot of other, you know, positions. And maybe it's because he didn't start the beginning of the season. Maybe it's because he got benched briefly. But I am, I am a big fan of Jalen Milrow. I just, I love the way he plays. Um, I like his ability to be a dual threat. I, you know, his yes, he may trust his legs just a little bit too much, especially under pressure. Um, but I think his ability to respond to being benched. And come back up and and then you know turn into just a dynamic player who put Alabama back in the national title picture and really was a key reason of why they were able to make it all the way to the college football playoff. Um, I think that I think he's he's a big part of that. And um, one of the things I think he has a, a potential to really elevate his game under Kalen DeBoer. Obviously, we saw what DeBoer did with Michael Penix Jr. And this is there are obviously two different quarterbacks in a lot of ways. But at the same time, I'm very curious to see how these new coaches do and and, and unlock his ability and maybe cater that offense to to give him opportunities to speed up his internal clock and maybe be a little bit more consistent and you know refine his mechanics and just get better overall. And if he does. I think the potential will match just the raw talent he has there. And he's he's my next selection. I think he would be a great quarterback to, to have. Yeah, I think that one of the things that happened last year is that there's – well, actually, to take even a step back from this, people just expect good quarterbacks to be Bryce Young from their first starts. Like what Bryce Young did is unbelievable. That that doesn't happen. Even – I mean, even I think you could look at C.J. Stroud, right? Like th that same cycle. It is so rare to be a first-time starting quarterback and to be good right away. The way that we've looked at the sport <laughs> for so much of history is when you have a first-year starting quarterback, that's your transitionary year. That, that's the year that you're trying to figure things out. And then maybe their second year is the year where they make the star turn. We, it's, we've gotten so spoiled with uh, first-year starting quarterbacks being not just good, but like Heisman caliber good, right? Like that doesn't happen usually in college football. And... So Jalen Milrow, I think, was compared so much, uh, not just to Bryce Young, but to Bryce Young's first season that I don't think people have taken seriously enough the idea that he not only can improve, but will improve dramatically. I, I made this comparison a couple of times. They're not uh, identical players by any means. Uh, and I think that it, th there's a way to make this a lazy comparison, but I, I don't think I'm going to. It reminds me a lot of Jalen Hurts, where Jalen Hurts comes in, year one, and he's not a great passer. 
Like, like he's not really ready to be an SEC caliber passer. I think Jalen Milrow was ahead. No, he's a third-year player, but I think he was ahead at uh, as a first-year starter than Jalen Hurts was. And what they both brought to the table is that they were able to both use their arm and their legs to make things happen for this Alabama offense. And we saw that, of course, multiple times. But I think what you have to like about Milrow is that as they figured out what he could do at the quarterback position, he continually got better over the course of the season. I mean, the fact that they got him up to 66% completion and 10 yards for pass attempt with some of the struggles that he had early is unbelievable. Like, that that's great. That's where you want to be heading into year two. And the other piece that you mentioned, like you said, Kalen DeBoer coming in as a proven quarterback developer, he's going to figure out what this kid can do at a high level. And also, by the way, they should have a really good offensive line this year with Caden Proctor uh, coming back from Iowa. So I I think that he absolutely, like you said, is one of the more undervalued players in this class. And it would not surprise me at all. Uh, Like, I'm not going to pick it. But if you told me at the end of the year that Jalen Milrow is the Heisman Trophy winner, I, I would not be that surprised. Could you imagine if he becomes a Heisman finalist and the amount of QB recruiting, uh, you know, cachet that Helen DeBoer is going to have? Like, it would be like, right. I mean, this would turn into like what Lincoln Riley kind of had going for yep. him there for a little bit. But if if you could... If Kalen DeBoer can do that and and even get close to it, like get him as like a, we're talking to him like we talked about Michael Penix Jr. this last season, like... Boy, oh boy, that 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 speaks just would speak highly, extremely highly of him. My goodness. So, who's your next selection? Yeah, I, I I'm having to stop myself because I think I'm 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 gonna get too cute if I if I'm not careful. I think that I just need to pick some of the best quarterbacks on the board. I'm gonna go with a, a player that I like a whole lot. Um, somebody who I think has unlimited upside, has the upside of being the best quarterback in his conference. I'm gonna go with Noah Fafita at Arizona. And so much of Arizona's potential for next year depends on that passing game. Uh, and actually, even, even you talk about their 10-win season last year, it depended on switching to Noah Fafita. He wasn't the opening day starter, but once he took over, this Arizona team hit another level. He threw for over 3,000 yards in, in just, I believe, 10 starts and proved that as a freshman, uh, I mean, he was ready for prime time. People forget Arizona lost in week two to Mississippi State in overtime. And that ended up being a pretty bad Mississippi State team. They played Stanford only within one point. And then when Fafita took over in week five or whatever it is against Washington, nearly beats Washington, nearly beats USC in triple overtime. And then they go and rattle off wins for the entire rest of their schedule. Seven straight wins to close the year. Now, this Arizona team, I I, I don't think is going to be as good as last year after some of the losses that they had. But I mean, you just have to trust Fafita at a certain point, right? Like, you have to trust that uh, he's going to be able to grow on his great initial season. And like I mentioned, I mean, Shador Sanders is up there as a quarterback in the Big 12. But if if Shador doesn't take a step forward, like, no, Fafita can be the best quarterback in the Big 12 this upcoming season. And if he is, like, they can maybe make the college football playoff. Yeah, I think that's a that's a good call. He was in my kind of my back bench of like depending on who you picked, who I was going to move up into my my particular <laughs> window. Um, I think he's at his best when he's under pressure. I mean, we saw again. I love that you pointed that out. Like when they threw him into the fire against two of the toughest opponents Arizona had, he nearly pulled it off. And he and the reason the team the Aaron Wildcats lost those games was not really on his shoulders. It was just the sort of a talent differential overall. Um, in fact, it was, we watched that triple overtime loss to, to USC. We literally watched the vector of two teams moving in opposite directions. It was yep. that moment on the scale where maybe a day, if they just waited a day and held that game on like a Sunday, <laughs> maybe that would have been the difference. <laughs> and, and Arizona would have won because by the end of the season, I think Arizona would have won that game nine times out of 10. Um, I think his, his, you know, again, he has a talent that, that surpasses some of his physical limitations because he's a little undersized. But again, he's got that control in the pocket. He's got a good arm. And and he's gonna and the, the fact that the Wildcats kept him. And and you know, some of his, you know, he has T Max also there. So they've got a good receiver that's gonna be there for him to throw to. Um, I think that's a big deal. And and I think it's gonna keep Arizona in the mix with when Brent Brennan's first season. And he's gonna be a big part of that. And I think that totally warrants him being one of the, the early ones off the board. 
So my next guy, um, and this is one where I was kind of thinking to myself, he, you know, he was a transfer. He transferred away from his school for a guy who ended up being quite good, um, maybe scared him off. But then he lands at a new school and the coach brings in a couple of quarterbacks to try and to see if he can keep his spot. And he stuck around and only got better. And it's Jackson Dart, former USC quarterback, goes to Ole Miss. Because, I mean, you know, Caleb Williams, he saw the writing on the wall. And maybe he could see, like, wow, okay, I'm a quarterback, but that's a quarterback. Kind of, I'm not, at least at this <laughs> stage of his career. So it turns out maybe he made the right call. And, like, yeah, this is uh, my swan. I, I'm not, not, not going to be the backup here. All right. So he goes to Ole Miss, Lane Kiffin being Lane Kiffin. You know, we all know that he pulled in Oklahoma State's QB. We thought, oh, wow, is that going to be the starter? Um, and Jackson Dart managed to raise his game up in his second season there. Um, cut down on his giveaways. You know, uh, he, again, he did a tremendous job in the Peach Bowl this past off, pardon me, at the end of last season. So, again, he he's returning. He's got good receivers joining him there. Um I think his ability to elevate his game is is definitely going to see whether or not he how far he goes. Like, will he be a Heisman candidate into the season? Is how far he can move because I know when they went out of that kind of RPO play action heavy offense that Lane Kiffin likes to go his his numbers weren't as great when they weren't running those kinds of plays. But I just love his attitude. I love his ability to do it. He seemed to. I just remember once he arrived at Ole Miss. That was around the time I remember NIL was really getting going. Like they were taking pictures together and you're kind of like with like stuff and cars in the background. And you're kind of <laughs> like, oh, my God, we are in the NIL era. Um, and I just his flash, his ability to just kind of have that level of swagger and the ability to stand up to a challenge when you, they brought two guys to replace you out of the portal with who he's got and his ability to lead that team. I, I really like uh, I really like Jackson Dart. No, it's it's a real good pick. I think that. He was one heading into last year that I would have considered myself out on. Um, I, I did not think that he had the goods as a passer. And I, I, I don't think he's a superstar as a passer still, but clearly he took a big step forward. Uh, they threw the ball downfield just a little bit more with him. He took care of the ball at a high level. He still is a dual threat type player. And now, I mean, the other piece, too, is that you want to talk about guys with high upside. I, I mean, this Ole Miss team has the chance to do things that Ole Miss has not really done since uh, since post segregation, and so I think that that's going to be a uh, I, I think it's going to be a huge opportunity for him for that program, and and like you said, I mean the fact that they brought in some extremely good players as transfers. Walker Howard from LSU was a former five star. Spencer Sanders was a four year starter at Oklahoma State. What a waste of his final season, by the way, dear lord. But uh, but ultimately, you know, he he ended up holding on to his job and ended up being a really good player for them uh, in, in a pretty historic year once again. So I'm, I'm excited to see what he does, but uh, I'll go ahead and move on to my next pick. One thing I do want to point out uh, just, just before we, we get going is that uh, Shadur Sanders, Quinn Ewers, Jalen Milrow, we're drafting a lot of Texans here. Because, uh, you know, we are the uh, the home of the great quarterbacks. <laughs> and you know what? Why not stay in the great state of Texas? I'm going to go with Preston Stone from SMU. And Preston Stone, uh, after a slow start to the, uh, to the 2023 season, I think they lost two of their first four games or something like that. They basically took over, right? And both of their losses were also to Power 5 opponents as well, and, and they just needed some time to kind of figure things out. Uh, once they, they sustained those two losses, they run through the AAC. They win their first AAC title since joining the league. It's their first conference title at SMU, I believe, since 1983. A pretty big deal, obviously, for SMU. Um, he, I will say he did miss the, uh, the actual AAC title game after suffering an injury, but like this was his team and when he decided to come to SMU this was kind of like the hope was that he could uh you know he was a high-end four-star guy he had offers from Alabama and a lot of them and um he decided to stay home and I think that he ended up being a huge player for SMU and uh, I think that now heading into the ACC, from the AAC to the ACC, I, I think that his profile is only going to rise. So I'm going to go with Preston Stone with my. So so now I'm up to four picks, three uh, three at large quarterbacks, and one transfer. 
that extra C is for championship level play. No, um, <laughs> so bad. You know, when we come back, we will now go through the back half of our selections and probably get to some quarterbacks and, and that are perhaps a little more chancier than others. But we'll see who we get here on the College Football Survivor Show. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line. All right, so getting back to it, we've both had our four picks. I went with four at-larges, you went with three at-larges and one transfer. Now I think it's time for me to drum up my own transfer pick. And this is a player I just like, even though I know technically he hasn't performed at the full level that people thought he would at FBS. But now he's at a team full of talent, and that's Cam Ward. And this is this is both... I don't even know where to begin. This is like this this next season is going to both demonstrate his ability and for, quite frankly, Mario Cristobal's coaching ability, where if you bring all the talent in, if you open up that wallet and throw money at every possible position that will accept it, can you finally field a team that brings Miami back to being the you that we all love to hate? You know, I mean, can they do that? Can they can they reach that pinnacle again? So Cam Ward. Many of you probably know his story, was a FCS star quarterback at Incarnate Word, went to Wazoo last season, didn't quite have a, the season they would have hoped at Wazoo, but some of it, again, you're not sure how much of it was him, how much of it was the coaching, how much of it was the talent around him at Wazoo versus the, the teams that they were playing. Um, it, one thing's undeniable, he has an incredible arm, he has great precision, um, for, again, you know, he was considered a draftable prospect, maybe not, you know, I don't know how early he probably would have been potentially a mid rounder. Um, part of the reason is consistency. Uh, and, and that's something, can he be less careless with the football? But I think, again, I'm not sure if that's a product of him, his own talent or just how he was being developed and the people around him. So, I love the upside on him. I love the potential for him. And I love this, this this program that Miami has built, at least with the talent on the field. And if they can break that barrier with him and some of these other great transfers they brought in and some of the players, they are already there. Some of the receivers, the established receivers they have for him. I think Cam Ward has a lot of potential and he would be someone I would pick as my first transfer, kind of more riskier selection. I, I made my first misstep of the draft. I was going to pick Cam Ward with my next pick. I should have picked him before Preston Stone. I think he would have been higher priority for me. I, I honestly take offense to the idea that he already isn't a good player. Like The one thing that we need to see from Cam Ward is he turns the ball over a lot. Like a lot, a lot. He fumbles. He throws interceptions. Like that, That's something he needs to clean up. Also, like you talk about Shador Sanders being a player who had to make something happen out of nothing. I mean, Cam Ward carried that Washington State offense over the last two years. He is an incredible talent. Uh, and and also, you you slighted his, his story a little bit. Uh, another Texan, by the way, off the board from West Columbia, Texas. But uh, he, you also forgot to mention that the reason he ended up at Incarnate Word is that his high school, West Columbia, played an option-based offense that barely threw the ball. They basically played the wishbone. And so because of that, he like never threw in high school. And Eric Morris, then the head coach at Incarnate Word, saw him and was like, wait, his physicals are insane, but nobody knows about him because he doesn't throw. And uh, and ended up signing him, basically hid him. They didn't they didn't say anything about him until he signed. They basically stashed him, which is something you can't really do anymore in the modern world of recruiting. He ends up at Incarnate Word. He follows, uh, of course, Eric Morris to Washington State, and the rest is history. And I love this pick too because you talk about the idea of uh, of some of his pros and cons at Washington State. We're about to see how he plays in structure, uh, and. Like I mentioned, I mean, he played in an offense that was not geared towards the skill sets when he was in high school. The first time that he had the chance to, he won the award for FCS Freshman of the Year. I'm very excited about Cam Ward playing in like a real offense under Shannon Dawson. And uh, yeah, I I truly regret not taking him uh, with my last pick. Well, then who do you have next? <laughs> Good question. So there's a couple different ways to go. Um 
like do I need to do I need to close up that uh, that second transfer spot now that because uh, I, I thought that I'd have Cam Ward available to me a little later, but unfortunately I I fumbled that one. Do I start looking at the limited number of first year quarterbacks who uh, have a lot of upside, or do I just take best available right now? And I will say out of the best available uh, for at large picks, there are several that I'm excited about who have some health questions. That's the hard part for me. Mm -hmm. Um, I don't want to name them as yet, but but most of them are pretty obvious who who I'm talking about. And the question is like, with the three that I've got on the board, am I comfortable at this point going with a player with a lot of downside just from a purely health perspective? I think the answer is yes. So I'm going to go with Jalen Daniels at Kansas, a player who was named preseason Big 12 Offensive Player of the Year last year and basically didn't play for most of the season. He he played the first three non-conference games and then ended up being out for the entire season um, managing a back injury. And back injuries are scary. Like, th- there's guys on this list who have had, you know, ACL injuries or something like that, and those suck, but, like, you kind of know how to rehab that a a back can just kind of never get better uh, as, as the olds listening to this, uh, to this podcast can probably attest to. And the thing is though, if Jalen Daniels is healthy, like Kansas can make the playoff. That that's how good they can be. That's how high the upside is. Uh, when he plays, he is truly one of the best players in all of college football. There's, there's no doubt about it. And he plays, for a program and in a system uh, under Lance Leipold that gets the most out of quarterbacks. And you look during his 2022 season when, by the way, he also got hurt, completed 66% of his passes, 18 touchdowns to four interceptions and limited game time. Also a rushing threat, though I expect them to use that aspect a little less because of his injury history. Like he can be maybe the best college quarterback in the country next year if everything comes together. And the other piece too, by the way, is that Kansas does not have a backup plan. Last year, they had a backup plan. Jason Dean was their backup plan. They don't have a backup plan this year. Their backup quarterback heading into next year is converted uh, or is former walk-on rather uh, Cole Ballard. So like, that's that's what we're working with, right? We're we're working with a, a situation where... It's Jalen Daniels, or maybe it's nothing. And I think that I trust, uh, I I think I trust him, but that definitely requires a certain amount of faith. Oh my goodness, that's Kansas. That is so Kansas. Uh, (laughs) Are we going to get, like, are we going to go retro Kansas in the middle of the uh, season? I hope not. And uh, and I think that was one of the big hesitations I had with Jalen Daniels was his, his, you know, health. Um, And, uh, because he's yet to play ten games in any season, as, as I recall. So we'll see where that where how he goes. I hope I hope he's healthy through the whole season because that that he is the reason that uh, Kansas can be an absolutely exciting team. So my goodness, you know, I was looking at who I was going to pick for my next quarterback, and I decided I'm going to go with another transfer pick. And again, I'm going to go with someone who maybe I'm I'm trusting that with the right coaching he can return to the the player he was because he was always a solid player and I'm kind of surprised that his transfer was almost a little bit under the radar and I never quite picked up on it and maybe it's because his head coach left and then just did an incredible job at his new team Um, and that is Grayson McCall because I think NC State has great coaching and can turn a QB around um, and he brings in just raw talent. I mean, he threw for 10,000 yards at Coastal Carolina, you know, almost 70% of his passing, you know, 88 touchdowns, 14 interceptions, and he ran for over a thousand yards. So he has the talent. He has that raw ability. Uh, you know, he was three times Sun Belt player of the year. He can be that guy. And I think NC state got someone who, is under the radar only because some of the bigger transfers that happened around him. Because obviously we everyone talked about, oh, where's Will Howard going to go? Oh, Riley Leonard went to Notre Dame. Oh, you know, obviously we talked about Cam Ward and Dylan, Dylan Gabriel were also great transfers. But I think he's the one who's going to be the sneaky one who if NC State, and again, 
it's not unrealistic to think the Wolfpack have a shot at not only making the playoff, but being one of the, the four seeds because of how this system is set up. I mean, as I kind of was, was tearing the ACC in my own mind, I was like, well, NC State and Louisville, they're teams where if they were to suddenly grab their way in, I would not be shocked. Um, they wouldn't be my favorites, but I would not be shocked. So, and if they do, it's because Grayson McCall really just clicked when he got to NC State. And I think Dave Dorian's staff would be able to, to take advantage of that. And he's one of those guys who I think with the right coach and can do that. No, I, I love this pick. Like you said, he's one of those players that I felt he was undervalued in the portal in some ways. I will say, like, he tr- he looked into transferring the year before. And the word is that he had some, like, minor academic issues that made it unclear whether he would have had some issues transferring those appear to be cleared up but that might have been a factor in why he wasn't so highly sought after in the portal and by the way like Tim Beck had no idea what to do with this dude last year like had no idea how to get the most out of one of the most exciting players in the transfer portal uh and I think that NC State like you mentioned I mean they managed to put together what a nine win season despite Brennan Armstrong not being anything like they hoped they played freshman MJ Morris for most of the season and then remember um, MJ Morris had that whole weird situation where he basically was like nah I'm, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna come back I'm gonna redshirt myself and then transfer which was so bizarre but welcome to the new world of college football <laughs> um I, I really like this fit. Uh, he's going to be working with Robert Ane at offensive coordinator, who is the guy who basically made Brennan Armstrong who he was during his time at Syracuse. So I'm hoping that he can find uh, some of the old magic as well. So I like this pick. I, I think that it's a good high upside pick as a transfer. And like you said, NC State, a very undervalued team heading into the 2024 season. And you know what? We're, I'm going to close out my uh, my my five at large picks right now uh, by by making that connection. Uh, Grace McCall, coached of course by Jamie Chadwell at Coastal Carolina. I'm going to take Jamie Chadwell's new quarterback, and that would be Caden Salter over at Liberty. Of course, Caden Salter put together an incredible season uh, during. Liberty's run to the New Year's Six. It didn't end the way that Liberty hoped, but I don't really care about that. Uh, it, it wasn't Caden Salter's fault. I know that much. Uh, he threw for nearly 3,000 yards, 30, 32 touchdowns, six interceptions, also ran for a nearly 1,100 yards, 12 touchdowns, like one of the most complete players in the class. People may remember he started his career initially committing to Tennessee, uh, ended up getting into some trouble, transferred to Liberty, has been you know, totally kept his nose clean since then. And uh, and I think that he, heading into the 2024 season, is one of the most proven players in college football. Uh, again, you talk about the touchdown production, 44 touchdowns coming back. Uh, he still has a lot of talent around him at Liberty. Certainly, uh, you expect that with their schedule and with the kind of down Conference USA, that uh, that they're going to have a real chance to be in the college football playoff once more. I, I would probably pick against it just because I think that People are going to hold uh, their I, I think people are going to hold in some ways their 2023 season against them. Uh, I think they're going to have to really dominate their schedule. They can't just win all their games just because of uh, questions about their schedule. But but Salter is really, really good. And I think that he is the catalyst of that team. And so for me, that rounds out my uh, my top five of, uh, of at large quarterbacks. I really like that pick. I was tempted, um, but I didn't bite on going on Caden Salter. And I was impressed that he stuck around with Liberty because I'm sure you freeze would have been happy to have him join him at Auburn this season. And it, in a lot of ways, it speaks to Jamie Chadwell's coaching ability. I mean, when Joe Mowgli had pulled him up to be his offensive coordinator at Coastal when he was the head coach of Charleston Southern, I remember him like, oh, wow, that's a that's an interesting move. And first of all, I was in, I, that that was one of those moments where I remember I finally really solidified how sometimes for even a very successful FCS quarterback, your hope isn't to necessarily be an FBS head coach, but being an offensive coordinator, wherever you can take it, as there's a pecking order even within those FCS jobs. But but every opportunity Chadwell's had, he's he's stepped up and proven that he can put together a great team. And for what exactly, as we were talking about with Grayson McCall, we're seeing with Caden Salter, and, and maybe that's part of why Caden's staying there. I'm sure, don't get me wrong, Liberty's they've got money. I'm sure he's being he's being taken care of. But at the same time, I've, I've been absolutely impressed by what he's done there. For my next pick, I'm actually going to go with my first 
time starter. Uh, I'm going to just break it up a little bit, mostly because it tells you how much faith I have in my final at-large pick. Um, but Garrett Nussmeyer at LSU, I think he's got an opportunity to step in and, you know, he's obviously he's stepping in some really big shoes. Daniels is obviously the Heisman winner, just a tremendous quarterback, a very different type of player. You know, they, the offensive quarter, yeah, he moved on, but they just they brought up the QB coach to be the offensive coordinator and Joe Sloan. And I'm sure, you know, they know the offense. They're not going to they're going to change it to suit Nussmeyer's ability, but they're not going to do anything that will probably be completely bizarre and will give him problems. I mean, he's got a good touch and a calm presence. If he can improve, you know, get a good deep ball going there, I think there's a real opportunity for LSU to to have, a, a, again, obviously there's a lot to be, we'll see where LSU goes this season. I mean, I'm very curious to see how that game against USC is going to go. But I think if I'm picking first start time starting quarterbacks, I'm going to go with a safe pick. Again, I'm, all my picks end up being safe. And to me, the safe pick is Nelson Meyer. No, I, th- I think that that's a great pick. Uh, I Look, I, I talked about on, on this program that I felt like LSU and I, I felt like Jaden Daniels was given a little too much credit for LSU's offense last year because they were good everywhere, right? Like they were a great, great team. Now they, they lost some players to the NFL at receiver, but I still think they're going to continue to be stacked at that position. And when you look at their offensive line, I mean, they might have the two top tackles in the upcoming class. They are really, really good along the offensive line. And Garrett Nussmeyer, obviously a pocket presence more than a dual threat player like Jaden Daniels was, but his production could be up there in a similar kind of way and maybe even more in some ways as a passer. I think he gives them a little more versatility from that perspective. And uh, look, I, I mean, obviously the, the natural thing is to just compare every pocket passer at LSU to Joe Burrow. But like, I think that he has some like, downfield Joe Burrow to his game at times. He he came in and played mop-up duty against Georgia back uh, in 2022 in the SEC title game, played really, really well. I I think it's a chance to be pretty special. So I think that that's a really good pick for your first time starting quarterback. So what do you got next? We've got a couple more left. Curious to see what direction you're going to take it. Yeah, so I've got – the funny thing is so – I have two picks left. You have one. None of us are picking against each other at this point. Cause I have to pick a transfer first time starter and you have to pick uh, your fifth overall quarterback. So that does mean that I can talk a little more openly about my process for, for making a pick. And I do think though, that with my second transfer joining Dylan Gabriel, I'm just going to keep it easy. I, I think it's Riley Leonard at Notre Dame. Now, Last year, I thought that Sam Hartman was going to be that dude, right? Like, I thought that he was going to be one of the best players in the country, and that didn't happen. At the same time, I think that uh, one thing that's being overlooked is the upgrade from Jared Parker at offensive coordinator to Mike Denbrock, who was the LSU offensive coordinator last year. It's not small, man. It is not a small improvement uh, when you talk about offensive coordinating, and I think that with Leonard coming in with the receiving talent that they have with the way that their offensive line is playing uh, with some of the options they have at running back Riley Leonard can be that final piece in so many ways. And the thing I like about him versus even a Hartman from last year is he does give you a little bit more as a, uh, as a dual threat type player. He was able to make things happen. And it's kind of like we talked about with Cam Ward where uh, for for Duke, like Riley Leonard kind of had to make stuff happen. He kind of had to create things. And now he'll have the ability to keep doing that, but he also has the opportunity to play in structure. So I do think that Riley Leonard has a chance to be one of the biggest hits uh, on the board uh, in this year's transfer class. I I like the pick. It's interesting to see how you pick two of the the quarterbacks who, who kind of, two of the three probably, Top quarterbacks are the most, I don't know, injury prone, or at least the ones that have had significant injuries. <laughs> true, where they kind true, of true. make you a little hesitant. So that I think was, now that we're, we can be more open because we're not picking against each other, as you pointed out, that was one of the things that was keeping me back on a few quarterbacks. Um, because I had, for example, Riley Leonard, depending on who you picked, I had him behind Will Howard. Um, if, if somehow both, you know, uh, Grace McCall and Will Howard somehow got picked out of me. Um and for that same reason, I it, it, like 
Oh gosh, Jaden Daniels is pretty. He was in my group of at larges, but he wasn't. He wasn't near the top only because again, and I hate being that way, and I hate like say, admitting that I get concerned about the health of these players. But that's one where if I'm if I'm counting on them for a whole season. So coming to my last at large pick again, uh, I had a couple of fun ones, but I decided to kind of put them a little further down. Like Avery Johnson, he is still a lot to be seen there. He'd almost be a first. I didn't know where to even place him. I guess because he kind of was with you know will howard so i'm, I'm not even sure where to rank I, I him i think there. he's a first time yeah. starter no he, he, he I would have been a first time starter yeah, i considered him but nice. again I, th- I felt uh nussmeyer was a little bit of a safer call there only because you know it just avery johnson's got a lot of upside but i'm not he's a little more unknown to me as as being a starting quarterback connor wigman again he's another guy i'm very curious about at texas a&m a lot of people have have, have hope for him but he wasn't Someone actually, the person who just finished outside of my at larges at this point was someone who the third quarterback with a lot of injury issues, and that's Cam Rising. Yep, and yep, yep. purely based on how much of a leader he was when he's healthy, and the fact that he led Utah to two Pac 12 championships and could very well lead them to a, a Big 10, cha- probably a Big 12 championship, should he stay healthy for this season. And that's that's a big hope, and I really hope he does because he's a fun player and an exciting guy to watch. So Going back to the theme of most of my picks, I'm going to a safe one, but one who is, who I think has a chance to really blossom. Because when you look at his number, I mean, it's one of those players where the box score kind of makes him not look as great as he could be. And, and, and maybe he unfairly took the blame for just a bland offense that didn't take advantage of him. They didn't chuck it deep as much as they maybe should. And now they've got a promising offensive coordinator in Andy uh, Kotelnicki. So oh, I am you're going to do this? You're, you're really going to do this? Drew oh, Aller is my number eight pick. Oh, I decided I'm going to go with him because I just think <laughs> he has got the arm. I think they didn't feature it enough, but they're going to change the playbook enough. I think he's good with ball security. He doesn't take, if anything, he doesn't take enough chances. Um, but I'm not sure if this is about the receivers that were around him and the ball and, and the play calling versus just his talent as a as a player. And I think with the right with the right system i think he can be really good and i think we're going to see what they hope for at penn state when he came there so i, I i'm going to go with drew aller he's he's my i i actually i actually let me be honest with you i went into this thinking like there's no way i'm going to pick drew aller and then i kind of went through my list yeah I'm like well it's flawed yeah. it's flawed <laughs> It, yeah, I'm like, who am I going to pick? And I just, I don't know. As I said, looking at the others, I think if Cam Rising hadn't had that big injury issue that I'm really worried about, I would have put him ahead of it. Um, but of right now, kind of comparing them all, he's my he's my final at large pick. Who <laughs> isn't already taken? <laughs> yeah, that's uh that's something that you can do. It's not something that I'm going to do, but uh, that's something you can do. <laughs> I I love that they added Andy Kotelnicki. Uh, if James Franklin lets him be him, which is not a guarantee, by the way, then I feel good about Penn State's offense at large. I don't know how exactly I feel, even with that context of Drew Aller in it. I mean, important context. They had one good receiver last year, and he decided to transfer so that he could play with Peyton Thorne instead. Like, that doesn't make me feel the greatest. And <laughs> they added Julian Fleming, who I do think is a good player from Ohio State. But, like, is Julian Fleming going to be the guy? Is he going to be the guy who is a safety blanket for Drew Aller in this offense? And the other piece with this, too, is that Andy Kotelnicki really does value a dual-threat quarterback. We saw that with Jason Bean. We saw that with Jalen Daniels. We saw that, I think, even back, uh, I think he was the offensive coordinator for, like, Tyree Jackson at Buffalo. Like, he likes a dual-threat quarterback. And Drew Aller can't even, like, walk straight half the time. Like, it's crazy. And so I hope that you're right. I, I mean, you know, obviously my my previous uh, podcast partner on the show, Doug Glay Maurice, is an Ohio guy, and he told me like uh, like Drew Aller is an Ohio guy as well, and everybody wanted Drew Aller, and everybody was excited about Drew Aller, and it just hasn't happened yet at Penn State, so I don't think it's a talent issue specifically, but. I just need to know that James Franklin is going to let this offense cook before I can feel like uh, like anything's going to happen. But I, I think I think with this fifth pick, it's not a bad pick. Uh, so I have one pick left. I'm going to run through some of my honorable mentions before I uh, before I make my last pick. So again, th- you mentioned Cameron Rising. If it hits, 
it's like, again, I don't know. I mean, it's the Noah Fafita tier of best quarterback in the Big 12 making a college football playoff. I think that they're the favorite anyway to make the college football playoff. And something that surely doesn't hurt is that Utah might jump from eight wins to the college football playoff just by adding Cameron Rising. And I do think it will be as simple as that. Uh, Will Howard, of course, is a transfer you mentioned. Chiron Drones, if this was like seven picks, I I think that he might have ended up on my list. Uh, Just, I think, a total game changer for Virginia Tech. They turned around completely once they put him in the starting lineup as a dual threat player. Jordan McLeod a transfer to Texas State from James Madison. He was the guy who kind of keyed James Madison's uh, big season last year, and now he's going to be starting for G.J. Kinney at Texas State. He's going to have a big year. Another group of five quarterback that I love is Byron Brown at South Florida, a first-year starter last year who I think like he is, as a dual-threat player, incredible. And two more guys who I'm just going to touch on are Connor Wigman at Texas A&M. And who really hasn't like gotten a fair shot to play because of injuries. Uh, and another one who I don't think hardly anybody knows about is Rocco Becht at Iowa State. Uh, they had a good quarterback in Hunter Deckers the year before that, who I was pretty excited about. And Hunter Deckers got caught up in the gambling investigation. Rocco Becht comes into the starting lineup and they improve the position in a lot of ways. Uh, he's in line for a big year for an Iowa State team that I've been very open. I'm excited about. Wh- who are some of your honorable mentions? Well, I, I touched on them a little bit. Again, like for me, it was Cam Rising, Avery Johnson, Connor Wigman, uh, Will Howard as a transfer. My first year quarterbacks, I was debating about picking Dylan Rayola yeah. only because of the excitement Ooh, that, just buying into that. And, but, and I do have my my first one, uh, first year quarterback left. So leave that one for a second. Oh, okay. Well, and then and then I had one other one there, but th- those were my those were mine. I uh, I was tempted by a few others. I uh, you know, gosh, Brady Cook. I just kind of thought was interesting, but I don't very know how much of that is. Yeah, very, yeah he's undervalued, very undervalued and. Um, and then, you know, Seth Hennigan from Memphis. He was also a G5 quarterback if I, uh, and I didn't get around to selecting him. But again, I think, especially since Memphis, I think is one of the teams that is going to be battling for that, that 12th spot in the CFP or higher, who knows, in that 12th spot for the CFP. I think if Memphis makes it, it's going to be on, it's going to be on his arm. No, that, those are good picks for sure. Uh, and, and actually, even on the first year quarterback from the group of five realm, I'm fascinated to watch Malachi Nelson and see if he can be that difference maker at Boise State. That said, my first year quarterback, I'm going to keep it safe. I'm going to go with Nico Iamalieva over at Tennessee. Uh, The fact that they started Joe Milton last year is crazy. Like, I I don't know. I, I understand why they did it. They have a sixth year player. So one, they they want to like lean on experience. And two, they don't want to throw Nico out there and kind of mess him up, right? Like we've seen this happen over and over again where somebody's thrown into the starting lineup before they're ready. But they were so flawed at quarterback last year. And with Nico coming in, I think that that changes dramatically. Uh, Nico, of course, one of the top quarterbacks, rated by some places as the top quarterback in the country. Uh, he comes in, plays the bowl game against a really good Iowa defense and kind of dices them up you know 151 yards a touchdown only throws the ball 19 times though they win 35 to 0 he doesn't have to do too much but the offense just looks better (laughs) when he goes in the lineup and I think that in an SEC that should be super competitive with a Tennessee roster that continues to grow every single year I mean, why not, right? Like, why not, Nico? Why not, Tennessee? Why can't they be one of the breakout teams? They do get both Alabama and Georgia. That's probably not the most ideal situation. But I think that if you can, like, pull the upset against Alabama at home on October 19th, again, Nico could be seen as one of the ascending quarterbacks in this class. And there's already so much hype and attention around him. Uh, I'm really excited to see what he can become. Absolutely. I think he was, he was absolutely one of my finalists um, for that spot. And I just went again, safer, um, which is what I tend to do. (laughs) You know, this is, this is a fun exercise. So just to kind of, again, I went first, so don't blame uh, Sean for the first pick, but our, our picks from one through 16, Shador Sanders, Carson Beck, Quinn Ewers, Dylan Gabriel is a transfer. The first transfer off the board, 
Jalen Milrow, Noah Fafita, Jackson Dart, Preston Stone, Cam Ward, Jalen Daniels, Grayson McCall, Caden Salter, Garrett Nussmeyer, Riley Leonard, Drew Aller, <laughs> and Nico Iamaleava. So uh, we have ourselves. I think that's still a solid group. I think there's a solid group of quarterbacks there. A lot of opportunities to see where they go. And, and a lot, as we said, are uh, very good people who were not picked. And both of us acknowledge that we had some that we think could be could be it. But we just were like, well, there's a reason why. And, and again, we mixed it up with a, with a few categories there. So really excited. This just makes me more excited for the season. I really can't wait to see <laughs> who here pans out. <laughs> no, well, and I, I think that you just look at this group like there is not an alpha necessarily like I think that Carson Beck is the best quarterback in the country but he's not a number one pick most likely uh and I don't think that his spot is unbeatable like there there was nothing that anybody could really do this year to be seen as better than Caleb Williams like I I just don't think that was ever going to happen or even Bryce uh Bryce Young the year before that in a lot of ways this is a completely wide open year from the quarterback position. And I think that that has a lot to do with why it feels like a very open year in college football is because we don't have an unbeatable, unstoppable force at the quarterback position, especially when you look at uh, some of these top teams. I mean, again, like certainly out of, you know, three of the top four heading into the year have a guy on this list with Carson Beck at Georgia, Quinn Ewers at Texas and Dylan Gabriel at Oregon but maybe the best team in the country, Ohio State, doesn't with Will Howard, who didn't make our list. Uh, and any one of those three guys that I just mentioned also might not end up on a postseason one of these lists. Uh, nothing is set in stone at this point, and I think that's what makes this upcoming season seem so fun. Absolutely. Well, wanted to just take a second to thank all of you for listening to us and uh, thank our producer, Joey Aliberti. Be sure to like, rate, and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. You can find us on X and TikTok, at CFB Survivor Show. He's Shahan Jayaraja. You can find his work at cbssports.com and at Shahan Jayaraja on X and TikTok. I'm Bob Ekairi, part of the group that runs at Reddit CFB. Thanks for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your week. The College Football Survivor Show, where playoff survival is always on the line.